Okay, welcome to the Strumzy community call on 22nd September. September, yes. Uh, and the main plan today is to go through the <clears throat> rest of the survey questions and hopefully finish them. So I guess we should jump to it, right? Uh, so the next section was about the comments about what bugs you the most. So the first point was not easy to combine social mechanisms to a single external listener. I guess that means using multiple different social mechanism on a single listener. Which is indeed not possible today. Has anyone ever raised a, a question or an issue about it? But I'd be curious to know whether many people run it that would be interested in running it that way or if it was just one person. I don't think I remember this having too many people asking about. Because at the end, we really support only two system mechanisms, OAuth and Scrum SHA. What was a bit more common question is to be able to enable TLS client authentication and Scrum SHA on a single listener. I think that come up a bit more often. To be honest, it's not completely clear to me what is the value of combining Scrum Shine OAuth on the same listener because I don't know, these seem to be significantly different for me that I would not mix them on a single listener, but maybe there are some use cases when it makes sense. I mean, if you want to authenticate with either, um, but not have multiple listeners, would be the use case, I guess. Yeah, but it's more about when exactly would you want it. Yeah, what like, the broader use case for why you'd want that, and yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like from from my experience, you usually don't want to mix the different things and and if you want to use OAuth then you want to have all users in some OAuth server and sometimes you want to use I don't know all your applications in OAuth server but have your admins to have username and password based access for some kind of management and so on. But then I'm not entirely sure you would kind of mix it into a single listener anyway. So that what I would be a bit more interesting. The MTLS and SASL, that's a bit different because you basically use both of them in parallel. And that can, for example, prevent the things like the recent Kafka CV where the MTLS would prevent some actors in theory to connect and trigger the 
the bug in the SASL, SASL authentication and not allowed to run the broker out of memory. So there I see a bit better use case, but I'm not entirely sure about mixing the OAuth mechanisms. I wonder Maybe. if it, sorry, carry on, Pella. No, no, I'll go on, Kate. I was just going to say, I wonder if it is just down to people having different clients that only support one or the other and that that maybe could be a reason. But... So the OAuth authentication supports the OAuth over plane today and that can be mixed. So if you have someone who doesn't support the OAuth VR mechanism, you can enable the OAuth over plane, which Marco developed, and you can mix those two on the on the same interface. I was wondering if it's just uh, so the user that were replied in this way, uh, it's related to some. Uh, I don't know, running in a restricted environment. Like for example, when you have different listeners, you have to open different ports, right? So may, maybe they want to open just one port, having just one listener and, uh, and mixing both. Maybe that will be a use case. Okay, so do we want to transform this into some needs proposal issue or something like that? Do we already have an issue for this in the uh, in the issue tracker? I doubt we have it for multiple SASL mechanisms. We might have one for the SASL and TLS. Okay, I mean, I think that would be a first step, wouldn't it? We can mark that as needs proposal, and then if someone wants to write a proposal for it, then that's fine. Yeah, I, it's not completely easy without proposal because the API is complicated there. The, today's API doesn't really support multiple authentications. Okay, do we, do we move to the next one? Yes, silence always mean yes. Okay, the next one is about the Kafka versions we support. Anyone has any quotes on this? Well, we explored this, didn't we, a couple of years ago, um, whether, you know, an alternative um, to this, where the operator, you know, didn't know so much about the, the container that it was operating. Um, and we just felt that that was going to be an awful lot of work with an awful lot of continual um, sort of testing overhead. Um, and yeah, we just felt that we couldn't provide the sort of the, the level of quality that we wanted uh, with that approach. That's my recollection anyway, like I say, it was a couple of years ago. Yeah, I think 
the CI and testing infrastructure is definitely one of the bottlenecks. And I guess at this point, at some point Kafka seemed a bit stable, but then with the craft, there were a lot of changes to the APIs and so on, which didn't make it completely easy either. Maybe after Kafka 4.0, maybe it gets a bit more stable again. Well, I mean, yeah, you need to, if you're going to have the operator talking to um, the brokers, then you obviously need to cope with the API changes um, and the possibility of getting sort of not supported um, exceptions from the admin client, for example. So again, it's about, um, you know, what our appetite is for coping with that versus you know just supporting a smaller range of Kafka versions um, which you know frees up time to work on other features it's really to me it's just a sort of a, a sort of a resourcing point we can either work on sort of supporting a, a wide range of Kafka brokers which I'm sure some users would appreciate but then we'll have less time to work on other features at the expense of, you know, certainly other users, but possibly also those same users. First bullet point, I guess their complaint is not necessarily that they want to, they're actually saying actively they want to be able to upgrade their Kafka clusters but aren't wanting to have to um, upgrade the Strimzy operator. I wonder what it is about upgrading the Strimzy operator that they're hesitant to do, or whether it's just because it's an extra task that they have to do each time. So this is really a point about how the operator is coupled to the operand images. And um, we don't have a, a good sort of abstraction for being able to operate on um, images that you know were prepared you know years ago for example um, or images that we don't know about at the time that we're writing the code in the operator uh, and that's kind of a hard problem you know so it manifests in all sorts of different ways about expectations about what is where within the container file system for example um, so it's not that it's impossible to abstract over, but it's an awful lot of work. Um, and again, it comes back to sort of the, the testing needed for that. Um, it's just not it's what we've done historically. Um, so yeah, Jakob? Well, that was the past view, right, about the container interface. But today, one of the newer issues which maybe wasn't there when we discussed this or investigated this a bit more last time we have the models for the dynamic reconfiguration and so on to know which fields can be changed dynamically which cannot be changed dynamically and so on so it's not just about the the images anymore right it's also about the the models mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in general, it's difficult. The operator sort of needs to know quite a lot about, you know, some arbitrary um, broker in order to know how to interact with it properly. Um, and whether that's the images or, you know, the, the broker and API versions um, that it supports that's, you know, running uh, as a container based on those images. And then you end up having in the code to sort of have all sorts of conditional logic about, okay, well, if it's supporting this API or if, you know, this particular binary is in this particular place or, you know, the file system's laid out like this, then do that. And, 
you know, it's just an awful lot of very tedious to write and tedious to test sort of abstraction code. Um, so it, again, it comes back to the maintenance of it. It's not that it's impossible to do, um, but it's doing it the way that we've done it so far, you know, gets us time to work on other things. And, you know, there'd definitely be benefits if we could, if, you know, we were able to abstract over that stuff more effectively. Um, you know, people would be able to upgrade their brokers, but not their operators or vice versa, for example, you know, probably within limits. But again, it, you then end up in tricky places where, okay, so there's always limits on, you know, what you can do maintaining compatibility. So then it's just like, okay, so can we reason about compatibility uh, now in you know, what is a sort of more sophisticated thing where there's not a single answer of, okay, well, you upgrade the operator and upgrade the brokers at the same time. That's at least nice and simple and consistent to reason about. Whereas any abstraction over, you know, sort of that interface between the operator and the workload, yeah, it gets harder to reason about compatibility. Is there a middle ground available that, you know, if limiting versions is kind of the pessimistic option that you just limit them because we don't have testing capacity or whatever, um, but we don't have an active reason to say that this version is incompatible or whatever. Can we take the optimistic approach and keep support adding versions until we find a breaking change, at which point there then becomes a chain, the supported versions has to shrink? We are Is already that... taking the optimistic approach. Okay, I picked up the like, wrong sense somewhere along the line then. That's like, fine. if you look, for example, on the current main branch, it supports six different Kafka versions, but the core of the testing is actually done only on the latest one. There's only very few tests done on uh, the older versions. So, so I think to a large extent, this is already the optimistic approach. Cool. So the tone of the second question implies that it's closed, the, the pessimistic approach, and that would be my sense, but quite happy to hear that I'm wrong. Yeah, I guess everyone's optimism and pessimism might look differently. And to be honest, if you ask every single user, I'm sure there will be users who will ask us to support Kafka 1.0, for example, still. So, yes, yeah, some of them simply want very old versions. To be honest, my impression of Kafka always was that kind of the consumer producer compatibility was usually much better than, for example, the admin API compatibility because there the features are evolving a bit faster than for the simple consumer and producer. So it actually always seemed to me relatively easy to upgrade the broker from the consumers and producers perspective. Am I missing there something? Does someone see some major obstacles for staying I mean, the admin, some old versions? The admin client, you know, generally provides the same compatibility guarantees. It's as if you use a, a new API with an old broker, then you get an exception and then you'd have to write code to fall back. So we saw that a long time ago when they added um, incremental alter configs um, and we started using that and then we basically reverted that change and you know because that was the simplest thing to do going back to alter configs because you know some of the broker versions that we wanted to support didn't yet support the incremental um, RPC um, and it's similar with other sort of churn in the admin client you know there's sort of there's new um, APIs been added that yes 
you can either sort of start making use of those, but then you have to have some code to cope with the contingency that you're operating on a broker which doesn't support them, or you can't make use of those, in which case you've got to be, you know, just careful when you're writing the code that you're only using, um, yeah, APIs that are available in all the range of brokers that you want to use. Yeah, I mean, you are right. Maybe the way I said it wasn't the the right way but that's that's what i meant that kind of a lot of the new features are affecting the admin apis and the broker operations but it doesn't seem to me that that many of them impact the consumers and producers so so what what would be good reasons to prevent people from upgrading their brokers Okay, hearing only silence, we want to move to the next point. So the resource consumption. Probably of the operator. Or of the whole Kafka cluster. I guess there's not much we can do about the Kafka cluster. Yeah, I think for the sake of having a concrete discussion, let's assume this is the operators. Anyone has any thoughts on this? In our use case, um, we did see situations where we needed to give um, Strimzy a great deal of a surprising amount of CPU when Strimzy was managing um, large numbers of Kafka um, clusters. And what we'd see if we didn't give it large amounts of CPU was um, queuing at a, a kind of C groups level. Seem to be something to do with the way Strimzy uses um, thread pooling or something like that. I'm sorry, it's been a, a while since I've looked at this, so I haven't got the details uh, on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, I guess the question is whether there's something reasonably easy what we can do about it. And I'm not sure there is, to be honest.
Yeah, I mean, certainly in the comparison with Golang based operators, the only, you know, sort of running on the JVM is always going to be more heavyweight, but the sort of the the main game in town there is, you know, doing something with Graal VM or Quarkus or something like that um, to re you know, reduce the memory needs. And even then, you're never going to get to Golang levels, but it would probably make a significant difference, but it would also be a, a massive effort in order to do that because neither of those comes for free. What we might be able to do is um, the way our operators work is the sort of the the timer based reconciliation will try and reconcile all the resources all at once, which I guess leads to more peaky, um, volatile uh, CPU usage and probably memory usage as well. So if we were to but change to that so that it spread out the reconciliation of those resources over the reconciliation interval. But I think you absolutely need that, especially in the cluster operator. Like you can't say that the reconciliation of this cluster will now wait 10 minutes until the previous clusters are reconciled, right? Yeah, but rather than sort of waiting 10 minutes and then trying to reconcile all of them at once, if we spread them out over the 10 minutes so they'd still each individually be on a 10 minute cycle but the peak sort of resource requirements would be lowered but the um, average re resource requirement would be higher but that means that you would only need to allocate for something close to that average rather than the current higher peaks you've awoken some memories there tom so the problem we were seeing when reconciling reconciling large numbers of Kafka instances was just that it was the it was the peaky nature of it um, that meant we had to give the um, the container a large amount of CPU to cope with these peaks. But as you say, kind of like there's then big quiet times when the operator is doing nothing. So that is a good characterization of the the problem which we saw. Looking at what the Java operator SDK are doing, um, they're definitely still, I guess, in the phase where they're starting to discover the best ways to do these sorts of things. So it'd be interesting to know if they're hitting similar problems, but they're looking at a mechanism where rather than having you reconcile your or sort of all your resources in one go, they've got this setup where they keep an eye on what the CR is doing and then they have that as some sort of in-memory context or something and then when they're reconciling the individual um, sub dependencies so if you've created a secret or service account or a pod or whatever they're then reconciling them differently so it might be interesting to look at the sort of flows that they're doing and whether any of those could be applied to Strimzy. But I know is, moving completely across is a massive deal, but it might be interesting to chat to them and see if there are any things we could tweak based that on That is a very is. naive approach, right? Because the bottleneck is not about watching all the different Kubernetes resources you create. The bottleneck why you have the periodical reconciliation is about the operand itself. And it's it's easy to set up watch for secrets and config maps and pods and stateful sets and deployments and so on and use them to trigger the reconciliation. But it's not completely easy to have a watch to kind of watch anything what happens in the operand and trigger the reconciliation. So that's the kind of the, the main reason for for having the periodical reconciliation is not necessarily what happens on the Kubernetes level. We actually never saw, like we thought that it might happen on the beginning, but 
I'm not aware of it ever being any problem which would suggest that we, for example, missed some watch on the on the Kubernetes level. But the Kubernetes level doesn't tell you anything about what's happening in the operand. So it's the operand which which is the main reason why the periodical reconciliation is there. And like the user operator is a fairly simple example of where you would really need to watch just few things in Kafka, but there are no watches available for that. So you actually don't have any, any really straightforward way to, to get the watch and to get a trigger when something changes inside Kafka and you basically need to check it periodically. Yeah, yeah, well, I wasn't necessarily saying that we shouldn't be doing the periodic reconciliation, we should be reconciling differently. It was just interesting to note that they've got a slightly different setup and it would be interesting to chat to them about it to see what choices they've made and whether there are things we could incorporate or whether whether we actually go because of the nature of what we're doing, it, it doesn't fit. I don't remember exactly, but maybe uh, the, the, the Go operator SDK provides the periodic reconciliation, or it has the same approach as the Java SDK with no periodic but watching operands. I, I remember that the Golang had a periodic reconciliation. I think the Golang one has it because at the end you find out that you simply need it. Yeah. But I, I, I have no idea whether it's done in the big bank approach where it does everything at once or whether it does things differently. So do we want to open some issue to, for example, investigate a bit more how the time is worth. I think that would be worth doing, yeah. When we say it's spreading... To be, to be honest, I don't think it's easy because there are other complicated things in there which will be hard to solve, like some of the metrics and so on. So yeah, it might need some sacrifices. So I was saying, when uh, we say spreading across, uh, yeah, spreading the periodical reconciliation over some time window, do we mean that uh, if my um, periodic time is, I don't know, two minutes and I have, uh, 20 Kafka resources, I am doing 10 in one reconciliation and <clears> 10 <throat> on the next reconciliation. This is what we mean here. My understanding is that what we mean here is that they will have each their own timer. So you wouldn't have the same second when the periodical reconciliation triggers for all of them, but you would have like in the first second, it will be triggered for this cluster, then three seconds later for ah, okay. another cluster, then 10 seconds later for another cluster, then three seconds later for two other clusters or something like that. That's what, how you meant it, Tom, or? Yeah, that's basically it. So using slightly more convenient numbers, uh, if you had a, a two minute reconciliation interval and say 120 resources, then you basically start reconcili reconciling uh you know a resource every second so you've got no control over how many resources you're reconciling any one time but on average you'd expect that you'd sort of reach a steady state of resource usage so so it means that yeah at some point uh, if today you have the operator to be idle for some time it's possible that with a lot of custom resources you have the operator instead reconciling always yeah it would with enough resources it would always be reconciling some number of resources hmm. i think the code would need to inject some kind of randomness because yeah 
if the operator yeah. is restarted, the ad watch fires for everything at the same time. So you can't just base it as in having a watch per resource, which simply starts when the resource is added by the watch. Sure that it's spread out evenly and you might as you say want some randomness anyway because it could be say that um, there are two resources which happen to yeah. take a long time or you know more memory or cpu to reconcile and if you're doing those at the same time then again you sort of end up with the the possibility of a peak so yeah there needs to be a little bit of thought about exactly how that scheduling happens Ahmed, you appear to have a hand up. If you're speaking, we can't hear you, or at least I can't hear you. Me neither. But you seem to be unmuted on the Slack level. He says he's got a mic problem in the chat there and will skip. So I guess we that means we should just carry on. Okay, maybe we move to the next one then. Uh -huh. I'm not entirely sure what this one means. Does it mean that you have to use the CA instead of just using no CA? Or does it mean that the user thinks he has to use the streams CA and not some other CA? Yeah, that was my same feeling. It's, yeah, it's not entirely clear. I would probably leap to the second interpretation, but then that's because I've spent time thinking about how we could have more abstract CA behavior. Like this, do you want to add something more? Yeah, I think that's a good summary. Okay, do we move to the next one? Okay, the Streamsy Kafka dashboard has five second refresh and the log size element breaks Grafana with large number of logs. I think the refresh is configurable or user can simply change it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so as far as I remember from the UI, you cannot change less than five seconds. I guess that you have to change the, the JSON behind that, if I remember correctly, the UI. Do you think that five seconds is that the, the point is that five seconds is too long? Maybe they want to be, to have a, I don't know, one second refresher. But anyway, well, we're talking about the log size, so surely a very high uh, refresh rate is not really what's interesting. Uh, you know, sort of if it was a one minute 
refresh size refresh time that would be sufficient wouldn't it i would have thought i.e. we want a longer refresh period for at least the log size part if that's possible in Grafana, I have no idea. I think that's dashboard or it's kind of a... We don't have a cluster running, but basically just change it here for the whole, whole chart, whole dashboard. Yeah, and anyway, you can edit in the, the, the JSON for having different values from the ones in the UI. Yeah. And the other stuff is that, yeah, you know, we always say that these are just examples, so. What about the chart with log size? It will be interesting to know what element breaks Grafana. What uh, breaks I it. think I can tell you quite easily. So it might be the only one. See who's some red lines on the on the screen. Who's drawing on my screen? Yeah, exactly. And I can I, see those too. I think so, it's a zoom thing. Yeah, that's I think it was Luke or someone. It was showing, but I don't remember. I might be misremembering it, but it was showing when it was drawing. I think this is the chart which is meant by this. Mm -hmm. And it certainly is quite ugly and I don't have too many topics, right? But just with the 50 consumer offset partitions on three different brokers and then few topics from some stream processing, it gets really, really, really messy. I've seen so that I... a while to take, to, to load with a lot of partitions as well, that graph to, to plot all the data, especially if you extend the time ranges as well, that's being yeah. plotted. So I guess the question is, what can we do about it? Should we change it to some, I don't really know what Grafana and Prometheus support, to be honest, table with paging, like the exporter has. Maybe we can have a different dashboard where you can select the topics and the partitions in drop down lists, but you cannot have all them all on the same graphs because anyway, it doesn't make much sense well like for the exporter we have these like for all these offsets we have these tables with the paging right maybe these work better in grafana than the chart they probably do because um I think it was the plotting of the data on the graph that was causing it, at least in Firefox, it was causing the page to to kind of hang. Um, and presumably it wouldn't in that table view. Uh, to Paolo's point as well, as well <clears throat> on that dashboard where the log size graph is, I believe you can select at the top, you can. I think you can select topic and partition at the top if you want, but I don't know if there's a better default than all and all to begin with. Yeah, you seem, it seems that you can select the year. I suppose one good thing is that I, because the log size chart is at the bottom of this dashboard, unless you have a very long vertical screen it won't load immediately by default unless you scroll to the bottom
Yeah, maybe this dashboard is uh, <coughs> is kind of filled by too many things. Maybe we could think to to try to spread across two different dashboards or more. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, good. Um, I think it makes sense that this dashboard gets analyzed. Like, I would be happy to try and look into it and see how we can improve it. Sometimes using panels, for example, that are by default collapsed, help with loading when there's a lot of data. Okay, so should we open an issue for it? Yeah. Okay. So the next point was about the RBAC authorization V1 beta 1. <clears throat> so we are actually not using it. That's just the backwards compatibility interceptor in the Fabricate library. And uh, yeah, there's this link to the discussion which goes through a bit more details about what does it do, why, how to disable it, and so on. So I don't think, and that's anyway disabled by default in Fabricate 6 in Streams 031. So I don't think we need to spend more time on this. The next one is the lack of clear documentation. I don't know, there's always someone who says the documentation is great and someone who says the documentation is not great. I guess some specific feedback on what is not clear would be great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's too too vague to actually act on. I was just wondering whether we we should put something out. Um, would would a small blog post asking for any feedback on the documentation where where people might see gaps or anything like that? Yeah, I guess it cannot hurt, if nothing else. We could look at doing some sort of Twitter poll for like different parts of the documentation or what people are missing. I don't think Twitter poll gives you specifics to act on. The thing about a Twitter poll is then sometimes people will comment underneath with more detail. That's the bit you want, really. Yeah, even 280 characters in Twitter, I'm not sure yeah, are. That's true. Have you have, have you done before any um, user interviews for the documentation? That's something that sometimes becomes helpful to get a different users with different levels of experience with Trimzy. Maybe just people who are still learning, people who are using it, and like give them different kind of tasks that they should want and they should they should do and find out watch them while they are trying to explore the documentation for this specific thing that they need to do and then get their feedback about what, what was useful what was hard stuff like that Uh, something that has been useful recently, I think, is to get the feedback from support. Uh, they've been raising issues where they've identified a gap in the documentation, and we've um, we've we've expanded or made updates accordingly. I think that's that's been quite useful. I wonder whether um, on the Strimsy documentation site. We could have signage up there like you see on many um, upstream projects where users are encouraged to open PRs against the documentation and to, to make suggestions to make things clearer, whether that could be a source of positive feedback. You mean like having a link? Yeah, um, I, I, sorry, I forget the, the words you quite often see, but it's like, um, you, you know, improved documentation which which uh, forks and gives you the ability to you know 
improve documentation, the users to uh, raise PRs to improve documentation. Yeah, I mean, that works best when the documentation is sort of paged rather than the way we sort of display it on the website. If you just sort of follow the links is one page for the a whole sort of documentation set. So that's a lot harder to sort of integrate that sort of thing. But when you've got a page per chapter or per section or whatever, then it's a lot easier for people to just sort of click a button and open a PR based, you know, whether that's a sort of fixing a typo or whatever. Um, but it doesn't seem that that's quite um, what is being asked for here. It says a lack of clear documentation. I just don't think that's, I mean, just doesn't really sort of fit. We've had a lot of um, people say how good the documentation is. Um, so it's difficult to interpret this comment in the light of that, you know, do we actually know that this person was aware of the documentation that there is, for example? Um, so I, personally, I wouldn't pay too much attention to this given the lack of specific, specificity. Okay, do we move to the next one? And again, I guess the next one. I'm not aware of too many such issues. So yeah, without knowing the specifics, I guess it's hard to to comment on it, to be honest. I know in the past there were problems here and there where the reconciliation got stuck and didn't release the lock at the end, which certainly required the restart. But I don't think that was ever something happening all the time. So and I'm not aware of any other issues which operator restart would solve. So, yeah, I was going to say um, I would agree that the experience that I've had is there was definitely a period of time where we felt like we were having to do this quite a lot, as you say, because of the locking problems. But that does seem to have improved a lot since that time. Obviously, it's hard to know whether the people having these issues, whether they're on an up-to-date version of Strimzy or whether they're running, because there was like, I think a few perhaps versions that had similar issues where it got better for a bit and then perhaps worse and then better again. But more recently, I haven't seen that particular issue like, at all. To be honest, I have never seen it and never heard any reports about that being a persistent issue. I can't remember what version of Strimzy we were on when we saw it, but it was a couple of years ago now. Um, but there was a short period where we were seeing it quite a lot, but after one or two releases, we then stopped seeing it. Okay, well, let's hope the person opens some issues. Not much more to do about it. Ahmed, you raise your hand. Um, just want to go back very quickly for the documentation point. I, I'm, I'm just worried that um, it's pretty common that people with frustration about things like documentation or the website or something like that are mostly silent. And people like contributors would start wondering maybe like, is, is that one of the reasons for not having a lot of contributors in some projects or whatever? And I wonder if it was worth to at least do some survey if that didn't happen before that is focused on the documentation. Um, sometimes that it gets mixed with documentation and um, first user um, uh, 
first time users or first time contributors it depends on what you want to focus on but like if we want to make sure that maybe the documentation is like we are happy with its current state would it be worth actually backing that by some actual data feedback My view is not necessarily about being happy or not happy about it. My problem is that there's a fairly big amount of users who say that that's the best documentation they ever saw and fairly big amount of users who say the documentation is complete crap. And it's hard to pick through them. And in the past, when I tried to get some specifics, I actually didn't manage to get any specifics from those who complain that it's bad even when chatting with them. So, so I think that's quite complicated and I don't know, maybe you need some special skills to do the survey for something like that. But I'm really quite skeptical that you can, that we can write a survey which actually tells us something about what's wrong in documentation. You can for sure have a survey which says, oh, so many people think the documentation is crap, so many people think the documentation is great, but I don't think it's easy to use a survey to extract the essence of why is it good or why is it bad. So I, I see your point. Um, I just want to like also emphasize that sometimes it's not about the existing being bad, but maybe something that is missing that they that they that they are looking for. And maybe it's worth that we look for that. I mean, like as a, as a project we're gonna always be improving our documentation. So I'm just saying maybe we can try to find out what's, what's or prioritize some stuff based on the feedback from the user about what do we need to improve more. But yeah, I think definitely it seems that you all have a, a lot of feedback before about the documentation being um goods for 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 many users and i think that's good enough for for the current status um i just saw that it might be useful uh, to do some yeah more investigation into what what are users lacking there yes yeah, so i'm not trying to suggest that 99 percent of the users find the documentation great and it's just few of them who don't like it that's not what I'm trying to suggest. What I'm trying to suggest is, or what I'm trying to say is that obviously we thought about getting the feedback from the users already before, like, sorry, but they didn't need it. You to suggest it for the first time, but it's more about how do you extract the feedback from the users? Because it's not as easy as it sounds from my experience, or at least I personally don't have the don't have the skill for that. So, so if you think, or maybe you are better than in that for me, which is for sure easily possible. So if you see someone on Slack or Twitter complaining about it, then yeah, feel free to give it a try and get some more proper explanation and proper feedback on what's wrong about it. But like, it's not that we didn't try it in the past, but it doesn't seem to be as easy to me as it sounds like saying get feedback or or find yeah. out what they don't that's, like that's more or less what i was trying to figure out okay thanks <laughs> yeah i was trying to figure out if we already reached for the users and then ask them for their feedback about it gotcha so every time i had someone on uh, on some place where i could reply complain about the docs i always asked for more specific things what would he change and so on but yeah to be honest 
I never got anything anything back would, would actually say more than just yeah it's bad but uh, again i think that's it's easily possible that kind of extracting this kind of information is kind of a communication skill and so on so if someone else wants to try go for it please uh, I'm wondering, as well as trying to encourage some feedback on the documentation, specific feedback, uh, we could also maybe make any potential changes more visible with proposals and that kind of thing. You know, so we, we were thinking about having, for example, the uh, a client development guide. So maybe we could try and encourage some feedback on what, how, how we want, to, what the direction of the, the documentation should be. I wonder, Paul, I, so I haven't looked at what the documentation, what information we have about adding to the documentation is, but you mentioned about a blog post to kind of get people's feedback, whether we should look at what do we currently have that explains to people how to add the documentation? Is there a short video or a little blog post we could write that says, here's the process for updating the documentation and then tweet that out to say, have you ever felt like the documentation could be improved? Would you like to contribute to Streamsy here? Um, it might be that no one actually does anything, but on the off chance that there's a person that goes, oh, actually, there is something that I've always wondered about changing, then that might be the prompt to get them to do it. We have even a documentation about adding things to the documentation. I know we do, but I can't remember where it is, but I haven't looked. So it might be as soon as I looked, I'd find it really easily. I'm not sure it's mentioned here, but it's certainly mentioned here. I think you just scrolled past it. I saw something that said open a PR and change up a bit more above spread the word. I don't know, maybe, maybe higher up than that. There, alternative, yeah. you can open a PR. I don't know what that links to. That links to the contribution guide. Oh, there it is. But it, it's, absolutely not obviously visible so yeah blog posts can probably yeah, maybe we should have it on that, uh, spread the word to bit more users maybe we should have it on that uh, doc page as well okay so we have run out of time so i guess we call it a gay day and get back to the rest of the questions next time. So thanks for joining and see you in two weeks. Thanks, 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 thanks very much. Bye. 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 Bye.